Hey everybody, uh, thank you for joining us for Skype a Scientist Live today. Um, we're going to be talking all about microbes and how microbes and animals live in association with each other um, with Kat Milling and Meyer. And so uh, our program is a nonprofit organization. And so if you can support our work, that's really, really important to do because we can uh, kind of keep doing this. And so you can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist or uh, paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist. Um, that's really all I have. The only other thing is that next week is museum week. So Monday and uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to be having talks from three curators and other uh, staff members at uh, the Museum of Natural History in Los Angeles. So that's going to be super cool. We're going to be talking about um, wildlife in LA, maritime societies, and shark jaws. So it's going to be super cool. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kat to introduce herself. Sorry for the interpreter. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just said hello. My name is Kat. Uh, my name is Nipaktuk. That's my Inupak name. Inupak Miaruna. I'm Inupak. Nipaktuk Miaruna from the Nipaktuk Mia tribe. And Kikik Dagaruk Miaruna. I'm from Kotzebue, Alaska. I like to introduce myself that way for two reasons. One is to let uh, Native students know that there is there are scientists who are Natives. Uh, another is to let my ancestors know that I'm speaking um, as their descendant and on their behalf and keep that in mind as, I'm, as I speak to people. I'm a microbiologist. I study the microbes in the gut. So these are really tiny things that are able to have a big influence on us. They shape our brain, they shape our behavior, they shape, um, they determine how well we grow. They play a really big role in making sure that we stay healthy and protecting us against microbes. And um, yeah, so I study that in these little tiny fish called three spine stickleback, and I'm excited to tell you about it today. Awesome. So um, could you first define for us, this is from uh, J. Rob, what exactly a microbe is? A microbe is something that's living that's so small that you need a microscope to be able to see it. So to give you some perspective, um, in our gut, we have trillions of microbes. They're so small that in our intestine right now, <laughs> there are so many microbes that we can't even really visualize how big of a number that is. Uh, they're living, they respond to the environment. Um, there are some microbes like viruses that are considered, you know, we're not so sure if they're living, but, they're, but they are all so small that we need a microscope to see them. Awesome. Um, so do you do most of your work in a laboratory or out in the field or a mix of both? I do a mix of both. Um, for the first uh, 10 or 15 years that I was a microbiologist, I only worked in the research laboratory. And so I would do a lot of things at the bench and a lot of uh, reading at my desk and data analysis at my desk. And then um, as a faculty member, I started working in the field. So that means that I go out to lakes around Alaska and find fish and look at the microbes that are associated with those fish and the microbes that are in the environment and try to figure out whether those microbes that are in the fish came from the water or their diet or are they different from one population of fish to another. So it's a mix. It's a mix of field and bench work. Awesome. So these uh, microbes that are associated with the fish you study, what do we think they're doing for the fish? So we know that they, um, that they stimulate the immune system. So the immune system is this complicated group of cells and molecules that um, fight microbes that might cause disease. And in our fish, we know that they stimulate the immune system so that that immune system is ready to fight microbes that might cause disease. Now the microbes that are stimulating that immune system are the beneficial microbes. They're the ones that don't cause disease or most likely not gonna cause disease in us. And so we're really interested in those microbes and how they stimulate the um, immune system, but they can also do things like make, and, um, make vitamins that we can't make or digest our food for us. And, uh, they, they play a large number of roles. The ones we're most interested are, um, the roles we're most interested in 
are the immune system and then stimulation of development. So what that means is as we go from babies to adults, we go through a lot of different changes and the microbes that are living in our gut and on our skin and all over our bodies are helping our body shape, um, are, are helping our body determine how quickly to grow and which, uh, which parts of our body should be developing at different times. So we're interested in those relationships. Awesome. Um, let's see, Raphael would like to know, are there different types of microbes? Ah, that's a great question. There are so many different types of microbes. Just in our gut, there are hundreds of types of microbes. They come in different shapes and different sizes. Uh, there are some that look like little balls. There are some that are brown or that are more like a, a rod shape. Um, if you look in the water, there are some that are green and others that are uh, transparent when you look at them under the microscope. There are some that are so big, you can, if you've got really good eyes, <laughs> you can see them with the naked eye. Um, and there are some that eat other microbes. So they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Awesome. Um, why did you choose to study microbiology? That's a really good question, again. Um, I wanted to become a medical doctor, and during uh, my undergraduate career, I decided to work in a research lab so that I would be more likely to get into medical school. But when I started working in the research lab, I discovered that people go to work every day and they learn something brand new that nobody else knew. And I just found that so exciting. Um, at some point, I joined a microbiology lab and I loved the fact that these little tiny things that you can't even see with your eye had this huge impact on your life. When I was an undergrad and a grad student, I studied microbes that cause disease, so potentially pathogenic microbes. But then as a postdoc and as a faculty member, I switched to microbes that can help us grow and, um, and, and keep us healthy. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's why I became a microbiologist. I was just so fascinated by the fact that these small things have such a big impact on our lives. Very cool. Um, so what is your favorite part of your job and your least favorite part of your job? <laughs> That's a, another good question. My favorite part of my job is I get to work with students and my students are learning new things too. And when they come through with a big breakthrough or even when they have a small breakthrough to maybe the science world, but to them, it's like this major uh, realization, I get so excited. Um, the other thing I really like is working out in the field. So when I go out to different parts of Alaska and grab fish, sometimes I'm in areas that are so remote we don't see anybody the entire day that we're there. Uh, other places I go to are right in the middle of the city. So I get to see people walking their dogs and talk to people about um, the research that I'm doing as they're trying to catch their trout and I'm, you know, catching my stickleback fish. So that's my favorite part of the job. Awesome. Um, let's see, Jacob would like to know, are there certain names for certain microbes? Yes, every microbe has its own name and it can be really complicated. A lot of them come from a combination of different words or people's names. Some of them are really hard to pronounce like Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Escherichia coli. Uh, they have lots of different names. Some of them um, are ones, that some of the time, uh, sometimes we refer to them as short names. So like I just said, Escherichia coli, and it sounds like a really big name, but when we talk about it in the lab, we actually call it E. coli. So we, you know, abbreviate that first Escherichia in part because we don't want to say Escherichia all day long. <laughs> yeah, valid. I can honestly barely say that word. It's really hard for me to say, even though I've been I've also studied microbes for a really long time. Um, is your research only in Alaska? Right now it's only in Alaska, but I'm moving to Connecticut. And so I'm thinking about the different kinds of questions that I can ask when I'm in Connecticut that I couldn't ask when I was in Alaska. Very cool. So are there stickleback like all over the country or mostly like in, in a lower latitude, uh, further north? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So the reason we study these fish is because they're found all over the northern hemisphere and they're in different bodies of water. So when I talk to scientists who study stickleback, I talk to scientists who are studying stickleback in Ireland and um, Japan and Russia and Canada and Alaska and in the United States, they go all the way down the coast to California. 
So they really cover a wide range and they're found in the East Coast and the West Coast. They're even found in the middle of the country in the Great Lakes. So they're really found all over the place. And what's fun about that is each body of water has different microbes and has different food sources and has different temperature ranges. And so as these fish are evolving in these different bodies of water, they're evolving different relationships with their microbes. Some microbes, they tend to enhance their growth, so help them grow better. And other microbes, they um, get, maybe get rid of those microbes because they don't offer them any benefit. And so we study how these populations have different microbes and then how those different microbes help the fish grow. Awesome. Um, what is your favorite microbe? <sighs> You can that's like asking. Off, that's too hard. <laughs> that's like asking who my favorite kid is or my favorite pet. Like that's just not fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, I really like the microbe Vibrio. Um, I tend to study uh, bacteria, and Vibrio is really fun. It looks like a little comma with a tail on it, and these uh, little microbes are able to live in the host as beneficial microbes or they can cause disease which i think is really fun to be able to study a microbe that can both help the host but then also cause disease do most microbes uh pretty much just stick to like if there's a group of family of microbes is it usually like this these guys are almost all bad de context dependent and are these microbes for the most part good and then vibrio are these like weirdos that switch back and forth that's a good question. So, you know, we used to put microbes in these little categories of these are bad and these are good, and most of them are good, right? But now it turns out that even microbes that we thought were bad, like Staphylococcus aureus, it turns out a lot of people carry Staphylococcus aureus around them all the time and it's not hurting them. So it's hard to really say that this microbe is bad or this group of microbes are bad and this group of microbes are good. Really, it's context dependent. How is the host doing? How are we doing? How, what other microbes are around? There are a lot of things that determine whether a microbe is going to be good or bad. Cool. Um, where do microbes usually live? Microbes live everywhere. They are on our skin, they're in the air, they're in our water. Uh, like I said, most microbes are beneficial or don't interact with us at all. And so we don't even recognize that there are literally hundreds of microbes, thousands of microbes around us, millions of microbes around us at all times. So they literally live everywhere. They even live in really hot places like, um, like in hot springs, or if, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, you know, those really big gushers, there's microbes in there. There's microbes living at the bottom of the ocean in hydrothermal vents where the water is so hot it's like bubbling out of the earth. There are microbes living there. There are microbes that live in the glaciers in Alaska. Uh, one of my colleagues studies those. So yeah, they're everywhere. Awesome. So um, you talked about how, they, how microbes can be helpful to stickleback, but what other animals uh, do microbes help? Microbes are found with pretty much every living thing. So um, they are in us and on us. They're on your cats and your dog. They're in the guts of the lions and the zoos. They're, they're on pretty much every living thing. And what's interesting, you know, we're studying how these microbes affect fish, but it turns out that some microbes are able to affect fish and humans and birds and, you know, so there are some microbes that are able to affect a large variety of different hosts and other microbes that really seem to be associated with one type of living thing or another. There are even microbes in our insects. So I've spoken with people who study the microbes in termite guts or in um, cockroach guts. Yeah, you know, they're, they're everywhere. Really cool. Um, do you have a second favorite symbiosis after stickleback? Oh, man, that's hard. <laughs> so um, I was teaching host microbe interactions at my university last semester, and I learned about these microbes that live inside other microbes, that live inside a bug, and the microbes that are in the very center actually are exchanging genes with the host, and so the host has learned to make part of the part of the um, microbe for the microbe, which is, it, it makes this molecule that the microbe needs to live. And it, I think right now, that's one of my favorite um, host microbe interaction stories. That's awesome. 
Um, let's see. Raphael wants to know, like, how old in evolutionary time are microbes? They are the first living things, which is fascinating. Um, we don't know if it was a virus or if it was a bacteria or if it was, you know, something else, but we know that the very first living things on Earth, billions, hundreds of billions of years ago, were microbes. And so what I like to tell people is that the earth was formed and then some time passed and then there were microbes and then a little bit more time passed and then there were fish and then a little more time passed and there were humans and we're all related. There are things that you find in microbes that you also find in fish that you also find in humans. We're all related. It's really fun. I just, just looked this up the other day because I was making a presentation and it's 3.77 billion years ago was the first microbial life. And then we didn't get even multicellular life until I think 600 something million years ago. So there was a huge amount of time where it was, microbes was it. That's all we had. So yeah, microbes are like the original earthlings. Um, Jacob would like yeah. to know, can microbes die by something else other than microbes? Like can other things kill them? Yeah. Um, we kill them. Uh, we kill them on a regular basis. Our immune cells kill microbes every day. They are doing the work for us and killing microbes. Um, things like sunlight can kill some microbes. Um, disinfectants can kill some microbes. That's one of the reasons we clean our surfaces with things like Lysol or bleach. It's because we're trying to get rid of microbes. Uh, metals. So um, some hospitals use copper to make their furniture because heavy metals like copper can kill microbes or at least inhibit their growth. So a lot of things kill microbes, both living things like our immune cells and not living things like um, chemicals. Very cool. Um, so what's one question that you're answering in the lab right now? Oh my gosh, I'm answering like six. <laughs> um, my favorite question right now, um, I have two favorites. One is I have uh, two students who are trying to figure out which microbes are growing in fish and why. So one of them is surveying lots of different fish and figuring out which microbes are there. And the other one is looking at which immune molecules that these fish have. And is there, um, do some populations have specific molecules on their immune cells that protect them or enhance the growth of some microbes? And then another student is looking at how, um, whether there are microbes that can degrade contaminants like crude oil in their gut. And if we use those microbes to treat fish who've been exposed to crude oil, can those fish grow uh, normally? That is so cool. I, I didn't yeah. know that. that's, really, that's a really cool project. Um, Mira, yeah. so this question is going to be uh, using language that we should then take a step down from. It's a little like up there. It's like a, somebody who knows what they're talking about kind of question. So try to answer it okay. uh, as simply as possible. In sticklebacks, do the microbes you study get passed vertically from parent to offspring or do they have to acquire them after the eggs hatch? That's a really good question too. So right now we think that the microbes are, that when, okay, let me stay, take a step back. Um, so for those of you who've ever seen fish out in the wild, you might have seen that they have little eggs, that they actually develop inside little eggs. We think that the, the fish we study are sterile, so that means that there are no bacteria inside of that little egg. And the fish develop inside of that, kind of like a chick developing inside of an egg, but eventually that fish comes out. And when it comes out, we know that for the first few days, it doesn't have any microbes in the gut. But then once the mouth opens and it's able to take things in, then it has microbes growing in the gut. So we know that's true for stickleback. We also know it's true for zebrafish. We don't know if it's true for all fish because there are something like 22,000 different species of fish. So we know a little bit about our little corner of the fish world, but we don't know about all the fish. And we also don't know if viruses are found in those little eggs. Right now we can test for um, specific types of bacteria, uh, specific types of microbes called bacteria, and another type of microbe called fungi, but we don't know, we don't have a good test for figuring out if viruses are inside the eggs. Awesome. Um, if you had all of like the, the resources it, at your disposal that you would need, what uh, kinds of questions would you want to ask? 
Oh, I have so many. <laughs> um, I'm interested in a lot of different things. So I think it's a hard question for me to ask because there are so many good questions out there. One of the questions I haven't been able to ask yet because I haven't gotten the funding for it is um, something completely unrelated to fish. I'm Alaska Native, I'm Inupak, and in our tribe, we use this um, plant called tundra tea. And it's this plant that grows to be about this big and it's found all over the tundra. And we clip it and dry it and make tea out of it. I think, thinking about the 10,000 years that we've been using it and knowing that we used it for um, diseases that are caused by microbes, I think it might have antimicrobial activity. So that means there might be something in that tea that kills microbes. I'd really like to study that and figure out if we can use that as um, either a probiotic to stimulate good bacteria or as an antimicrobial to kill microbes that we don't want to have make us sick. Awesome, so that leads into um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Like, how um, can we incorporate indigenous knowledge into like the kind of uh, European approach to science that um, is often in academia? How can we like incorporate those two respectfully? Yeah, there's a lot of ways. Um, there's actually a, a, a conference going on virtually right now uh, really? on um, called Decolonized Science, and it's run by a woman who's thought a lot about the different ways that we can incorporate traditional knowledge into science. And um, the traditional knowledge has actually been used in many different ways in science. So when you think about the different plants that we use to get medicine from, like the, the willow plant that you know provided aspirin originally, or the, the plant that was used to treat malaria, that those were pieces of traditional knowledge that were brought into Western science and tested in Western science, but they were originally identified as plants that might provide some benefit by people who um, had been using them for thousands of years. Another great example is I just saw a study that showed that the, um, not just, but this past fall, I saw a study that showed that the clothes that Alaska natives wear are the best for keeping us warm when it's cold out. And I was like, we know that. <laughs> so they, yeah, so they did that research to really confirm what we had already known. So there's a lot of knowledge that indigenous tribes have that um, Western science has not paid close attention to or, or has paid attention to, but not acknowledged the tribes that provided that original information. Right. Um, out of curiosity, like, what was it about the clothing that, like, was the key to warmth? Do they know? Uh, there's a few things. One is the material. So it's furs from animals that are, are built, that have evolved to survive these cold temperatures. So they have different layers of fur. They have um, skin that is not, um, that's resistant to wind. And the, the clothes that we use tend to be a single piece. So right now, I'm wearing something called an uttuk look, and it's basically a one-piece shirt that helps retain warmth um, when it's cold out. So I'm actually really warm in this right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, sounds good. Um, that's really cool. So uh, Raphael would like to know, who first discovered microbes? Uh, so if you, um, so the very first person who, described them under the microscope was Antoni, oh, I'm going to butcher his na his last name, Lubenhoek. Oh, I think I butchered it. Nailed it. No, uh, no, but he was, totally <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but he described microbes under the microscope, but the problem is he didn't tell anybody how to build the microscopes. So he described them, and then it was a long time before the next person was able to make a new microscope to be able to describe them further. But um, last year, my students and I went back and read one of his original papers, and he described microbes in rainwater, and he described microbes in the teeth, and microbes in healthy mouths versus um, people who had disease. So it was a long time ago. It was well over 200 years ago. Awesome. Um, are there microbes in space? We think so. Um, and there are a uh, specific microbiologist called astro, um, 
astromicrobiologists, I think is their term, and they study microbes in space. And some people actually study the microbes on Earth to see if we can figure out anything about the microbes in space before we even go out there. Uh, another thing to consider is we put a lot of stuff in space, right? So all those satellites that we have out there are things that we put out there and they're not sterile. We, we built them. We, <laughs> they had to go through our atmosphere, which is just riddled with microbes. So we've actually sent microbes out into space. Awesome. Um, where's your, what's like your favorite thing that you've done doing field work um, as being a scientist? I have a site that I go to on a regular basis that's out in the middle of nowhere. And it's just, it's really quiet and I can see the fish. I can actually look down into the water and see the, the fish um, interacting with each other and protecting their nests and dragging pieces of um, grass around to build a new nest where they put their eggs. So I think that's, that's my favorite part about field science is actually being able to see these fish out in the wild. Awesome. Um, Jennifer would like to know, what is your least favorite microbe? Oh, oh you're breaking my heart. <laughs> How do I pick my least favorite microbe? Well, you know, I've never been good at studying uh, fungi. There are so many different types and they are able to have different shapes at, during different parts of their life cycle. And so if I had to pick my least favorite microbe, it would probably, uh, oh, I do know, mushrooms. I don't like mushrooms. Mushrooms are microbes. They actually start out as individual little tiny fungi that um, land in a place and then build some roots some below that we can't see. And then they come up. And I don't like the way they taste. I don't like the way they feel when I walk on them. So fungi, uh, mushrooms. Mushrooms are by <laughs> far my least favorite microbe. Sounds good. Uh, I love mushrooms, but uh, that's okay, <laughs> I understand. Um, J-Rob would like to know, uh, what's the biggest microbe and smallest microbe? That's hard. That is hard. So fungi actually are um, microbes. And the reason that they're called microbes is because they have a part of their life cycle that's so small that you can't see them with, uh, you have to use a microscope to see them. And there are mushrooms that have covered acres of land, a single mushroom that has root system underneath the land, and we only see the little mushrooms on top. So I think that would be considered the largest, the largest microbe. Um, what was the other question? Uh, biggest and smallest. So the smallest. So the smallest would be virus. The viruses tend to be much smaller than most bacteria. And in fact, there are viruses that infect bacteria called phage. So I think viruses are the smallest. Sounds good. Um, can I tell you a story about uh, microbes right now that I, I just don't get a chance to talk about much? Are you familiar with, you know, Dictostelium? Yes. Uh, so Dictostelium are a type of amoeba. They live in the soil. And um, we, like scientists in, in the past, you know, I don't know, 20 years, discovered that um, we already knew that they eat bacteria. That's just like, what's for dinner for a dictostelium. Um, but we realized that, okay, so dictostelium are cool for a lot of reasons. They're really, really nice for studying in the lab because they're very easy to grow and um, they eat bacteria so that's easy to feed. And so um, when they get too hungry, if you starve them, they all gather together and become a multicellular organism. And it is wild. They look like slugs that you can see with your naked eye. And so they like, they crawl around, crawl around, and then they like funnel themselves upward and then become a little like spore basically. And then uh, that is what's yeah. somewhere else. And so that is already like so, 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 so cool. But we realized that they're taking some of the bacteria that they eat and putting them in like a little pocket inside of the cell. This is like a single cellular organism. This is a microbe. And then they're seeding their environment that they move to um, that doesn't have enough food, effectively farming their food. And so we think of farming as being a pretty like complicated thing, but then there are these like microbes that are farming other microbes. And that is yeah. like, so cool. Um, so one of the things I've never been able to follow up on, but I think is really cool is 
when I grow little fish, I put them in a flask that's about this big and the flask has a flat bottom. And I can look at that bottom under the microscope and there are certain types of eukaryotes and um, I can see the eukaryotes and the bacteria. So bacteria tend to be smaller than eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are microbes that have uh, nuclei in them and other big things like us, we're eukaryotes. <laughs> um, but these eukaryotes will gather the bacteria in little piles and they'll be like, you can see little pathways where the, the eukaryotes go and then there'll be a pile of um, bacteria. And I have wanted to study that to figure out are these, are the eukaryotes actually making the piles? And then are there specific microbes in those piles? And then are they, are those microbes alive or dead? Like there's so many questions I want to ask about those little piles of microbes that the eukaryotes are making. That's but awesome. of course there's, there's only so many questions you can answer in a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the hardest part of being a scientist, that you can't answer all the questions that you come up with. Yeah. Yes. Oh. So you're saying that, so what is in this flask from the get-go when you start the flask? It's fish and then um, a little bit of water that we take from tanks where bigger fish are swimming, uh, swimming in. So we take um, some water from, a, from an adult tank and put it into the flask with the little baby fish and then allow all of that to grow as a little miniature ecosystem for a couple of weeks and then we take the fish out and look at them and sometimes we look at the microbes in the water too. That's super cool. You need to get a time lapse of that thing and figure out what the heck everybody's doing. That's cool. Right? <laughs> so J-Rob would like to know, uh, are there microbes in the soil? Yes, there are so many microbes in the soil and they're important ones too because they take some nutrients that um, other things that live in the soil need and break it down and then present that food source to the other living things like worms or plants. The microbes in the soil are actually really important for helping our plants grow. Um, the other thing they're really good for is making antibiotics. So when you think about the last time you got sick and you took some sort of antibiotic, um, it most likely was an antibiotic that was first discovered in a soil microbe. Like Acinomycetes makes did I say that right? <laughs> um, makes a lot of antimicrobials that we that we use. Uh, the fungi that was first um, identified, uh, penicillin, was a, a fungi that comes in that was that came from the air and landed on a plate and killed microbes, and that's how um, Fleming identified it. But it also um, can be found in the soil as well. So there are a lot of microbes in the soil that make antibiotics. Awesome. Um, yeah, soil microbes are, are very, very cool. Um, Hila would like to know, uh, how is the fish microbiome different from the human microbiome? That's a good question. So there are actually a lot of microbes that humans have that the fish have as well. So that's really helpful for us because we use it to study things that might be important in humans. But there are also microbes that we found in fish that we don't find in humans. So there are some archaea that we found in one population of fish, but not others. And archaea are really cool because they're like bacteria, but they're also like eukaryotes. So they're like this little hybrid. Um, we also found uh, some microbes that are found in lots of different fish species. So that's cool because that might be a microbe that's common to all sorts of fish but isn't always found in humans. So lots of different microbes. Some of them are in humans and some of them are not. Awesome. Um, Raphael would like to know, is there a place with no microbes? Ooh, so there are special rooms that people build called clean rooms and they are disinfected. They're treated with disinfectant before we go in them. Those don't have microbes. Um, we also used to use these big bubbles, and in fact, a lot of mice facilities, uh, mouse facilities use these big bubbles, and they raise the animals inside that bubble, and that bubble has no microbes in it. Um, those are the, the types of places that would have no microbes. Most places have microbes. Cool. Um, Rafa, this is, this is also a hard question, but what are microbes made of? So microbes are made of a lot of different chemicals or molecules. When you um, study microbiology, you actually have to study a lot of other fields too. And one I did not have to, I did not expect to study so much was chemistry. And it turns out that microbes are made of a lot of different chemicals and they have lots of different structures to them. 
And some of them are really easy, like water. Water is um, an, uh, an oxygen with two hydrogens, right? That's pretty easy. But then some of them are really big. And so the, the bacteria or the virus or the, the fungi have to be able to make these really big complicated molecules. Other scientists are trying to study how they make those really big chemicals or big molecules. Yeah, I also didn't anticipate the amount of biochemistry I would need when I became a scientist. I was like, uh, oh God. Yeah. Um, but it was all, it all turned out fine. Um, yeah. Conlin would like to know, what is the most deadly microbe? That's a tough question. Um, in part because there are, there are some microbes that only cause disease under um, specific types of conditions. And there are other microbes that are really good at being passed from one person to another, but then, and, and eventually might kill the host, but they can also live with that host for a long time. So I used to study this parasite called Toxoplasma, and this parasite lives inside of our cells. And when we're healthy, it stays, um, stays put and stays in this little thing called a cyst and doesn't cause disease. But when we're not healthy and our immune system isn't working right, the parasites replicate and come out of the cyst and destroy the cells it's in, like our brain cells or our heart cells or whatever. So there are microbes that, are, and, and that's very deadly, um, but it's only deadly when we're sick. So if you think about a microbe that is very deadly all the time or most of the time, um, I think of the ones that cause pandemics like uh, SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> or sars 2 cov <laughs> um, coronavirus. Uh, another one would be the flu virus. That's really deadly, if, uh, but fortunately we have vaccines to keep us healthy um, or to prevent that, that virus from infecting us. There are also some bacteria that cause a lot of disease. So uh, we think about like E. coli, which can be a normal member of our microbiota, but if it has a specific type of gene in it, it can destroy our in, um, intestinal cells and cause um, a lot of disease. So there are, it's, it's hard to identify the deadliest. Yeah, that's a really complicated question based on a lot yeah. of different things. Um, should, can we talk about um, eHEC? Uh, <laughs> it's so weird and so cool. So I, I'm just gonna talk about it really quick. There's so much to talk okay. about with microbes because it's such a big right. deal. But this is just yeah. like, I like to bring up some of the like microbes greatest hits. And so yeah. one of them, um, there's this type of E. coli um, called, I think, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Yeah. And so basically that's the kind of thing where if you eat like a bad burger and then you get super duper sick, like that's um, what you got. It's also responsible for a lot of these, um, uh, outbreaks that happen around uh, leafy greens when when yeah. it's like nobody eat the romaine lettuce like that's the thing that caused it um, or at least a close relative and what's so cool when you watch these microbes under the microscope is that they take the what's called the cytoskeleton so basically the structure of the cells um, that are lining your um, your like intestines they take over that system and make little surfboards with the yeah. uh, cytoskeleton. And so you have this like little microbe on top of a little surfboard and it's like zooming, or literally surfing and zooming around the surface of the, our cells. And it's yeah. like hilarious when you're looking at it on the microscope, but like when you take a step back, you're like, actually this is like horrifying and deadly and very bad, but so weird and so cool. And so yeah. um, anyway, that's something that's definitely deadly, but when you study it, it's so cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like just can't believe they've figured that out evolutionarily. Um, right. Can't believe it. Um, but back to the questions. Hilo would like to know, uh, how is the microbiome of fish in the lab different from the microbiome of fish out in the wild? And mm. how do social interactions influence the microbiome? Two very good questions. So if we raise our fish in the lab and we don't put um, microbes from the lake into the, the water that the fish are swimming in, they have fewer types of microbes. So that another way of saying that is their diversity is low. If you take some lab water though and put it in with the, the water that the fish are growing in, then the diversity is really high and it's similar to the, the lake. And the reason for that is that we keep the same 
concentration of salt and the same temperature and the same light cycle, we try to make the lab look as much like the wild as we can. Um, the second part of that question is really cool. So there are a number of people who study that, and our lab has studied this too, um, which microbes are responsible for behavior. So it turns out we know in humans that different microbes are associated with different types of um, behavioral issues in humans. And we know that there are some microbes in fish and, um, and other animals that can change the behavior of the, of the fish. Um, some of them are really good at helping the brain develop. And so they stimulate um, the development of the brain, which can help them learn how to do things like school together or, or uh, evade predators that might come down and grab fish out of the water. Uh, there are other microbes, um, oh, toxoplasma again, that will change the behavior of the host so that the microbe gets passed from one host to another. So if you've heard that, um, uh, what was the, the if you've heard that uh, microbes can affect the behavior of mice, like toxoplasma can inf infect the brain and affect the behavior of the mice. So it's most likely, it's more likely to be eaten by cats. And then that microbe gets transferred to cats and then it can grow in that organism. So microbes can affect behavior in many different ways, in fish and in other animals. There's a whole book on this called Parasite by um, Carl Zimmer that I love because it talks about the different types of microbes that can affect the behavior and other aspects of the host. It's a good book. It's older. I, I think he needs to update it, but yeah. <laughs> I really like that book. Um, uh, Parasite Rex is what it's called. Parasite Rex. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we try to keep these to be about 45 minutes and we are okay. running up on 45 minutes. So. Um, we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. The first is what do you wish everybody in the world knew related to your area of expertise? And then the second question is what is, you, what is something you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as simple or significant as you'd like. Okay, so the first one, I wish that people knew that just because you study how microbes interact with one thing, that doesn't mean that you know how microbes interact with everything. So that's true for studying how microbes interact with flies versus worms versus mice versus humans, but it's also um, the same for within a population, within a species. So for example, when we study microbes in stickleback and we look at one population, we see a different uh, relationship between those microbes and those fish as um, fish from a different population. So even within a species, it helps to study different families and different populations within that species. And then um, for the second question, I wish people knew just how diverse, if this doesn't have as much to do with um, science, but I wish people realized how diverse native communities are and that we are still here. So I'm indigenous, I'm Inupak, that's one of um, over 500 different tribes that we have in the United States. And there are over 5 million American Indians in the United States. And that's just the indigenous of Native America. There's also indigenous people who live in Australia and New Zealand and Russia and all in Canada. And all of us have different uh, traditions, different languages, different knowledge, different pieces of knowledge that, are, that could really help science. So I think that's another important thing that's not completely related to science that I wish everybody knew. That's super important. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, where can we find you online, et cetera? Yeah. So I use my Inupak name on Twitter and everything else. It's Napakduk, N-A-P-A-A-Q-T-U-K. Um, that means tree in my language, and that's my Inupak name. Um, other than that, I don't really have anything to, to plug. I just, I like talking to people. I'm on Skype as scientists. So if you're interested in hearing more about what I do and you want your classroom to know more about what I do, uh, sign up with Skype as scientists and maybe we'll, maybe we'll be able to chat with each other. Great, okay, thanks. And uh, thank you, Erin, for signing for us today. Uh, thanks, Kat, for being with us. Um, let's see, next week is museum week. So uh, join us for that. 
Um, we've got a good schedule coming out for next month that'll be released soon. Um, and other than that, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, so if you can support our work at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist, that helps us continue to be able to offer stuff like this. Um, and we really need everyone's support to keep it going. So um, thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.